after the death of Lord Beesbury, there was no more dissent among the small council. The rest of the night was spent making plans for Aegon's coronation. It must be done quickly. All agreed, and the drawing up of lists of possible allies and potential enemies followed. Should Princess Rhaenyra refuse Aegon's succession to the throne, with the princess in confinement on Dragonstone, about to give birth, Queen Alicent and her greens enjoyed an advantage. The longer Rhaenyra remained ignorant of her father's death, the slower she would be to move. Maybe perhaps she would die in childbirth, Queen Alicent is reported to have said. No ravens flew that night. No bells rang. The servants, who knew of the king's passing, were sent to the dungeons. Sir Criston Cole, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, was given the task of taking into custody such blacks that remained at court. The lords and knights who might be inclined to favour Princess Rhaenyra and her claim to the throne do them no violence unless they resist the hand of the king, Sir Otto Hightower told the Lord Commander. Such men as bend the knee and swear fealty to King Aegon shall suffer no harm at our hand. We have to rule the realm after we have won it. And those who will not bend the knee, asked Grandmaster Orwell, are traitors said Ironrod, and must die a traitor's death. Lord Larry Strong, the master of whispers, then spoke for the first and only time that night. Let us be the first to swear, he said, lest there be traitors still here among us. Drawing a dagger, the clubfoot drew it across his palm, a blood oath, he urged, to bind all of us together, brothers unto death. And so each of the conspirators slashed their palms and clasped their hands with one another, swearing brotherhood. Queen Alicent alone amongst them was excluded from the oath on account of her womanhood and being the queen. Dawn was breaking over the city before Queen Alicent dispatched the king's guard to bring her sons, Aegon and Aemon, to the council. Prince Daron, the youngest and gentlest of her children, was in Old Town, serving as Lord Hightower's squire. One-eyed Prince Aemon, 19, was found in the armoury, donning plate and mail for his morning practice in the castle yard. Is Aegon king? He asked Sir Willis Fell. Or must we kneel and kiss the old whore? Princess Helena was feeding her children when the king's guard came to her. When asked about the whereabouts of Prince Aegon, her brother and husband, she only said, He's not in my bed, you may be sure. You're free to search beneath the blankets. There are those that claim that Sir Criston found the young king to be, drunk and naked in a flea-bottom rat pit, where two gutter snipes with foul teeth were biting and tearing at each other for his amusement, whilst a girl who could be no more than twelve was in his bed. How much truth to these claims is unknown. The more likely scenario is Aegon was with a paramour when he was found. The girl was a daughter of a wealthy trader and well cared for. The prince at first refused to be part of his mother's plans. My sister is the heir, not me. What sort of brother steals his sister's birthright? It was only when Sir Kristen Cole convinced him that the princess must surely execute him and his brothers. Should she don the crown, did Aegon waver? Was any true-born Targaryen yet lives? No strong can ever hope to sit the Iron Throne. Cole said. Rhaenyra had no choice but to take your heads if she wishes her bastards to rule after her. It was this, and only this, that persuaded Aegon to accept the crown that the small council was offering him. Whilst the knights of the King's Guard were seeking after Queen Alicent's sons, other messengers summoned the commander of the city watch and his captains. There were seven, each commanding one of the city gates. Five were judged to be sympathetic to Prince Aegon's cause when questioned. The other two, along with their commander, were deemed untrustworthy and found themselves in chains. Sir Luther Largent, the most fearsome of the Leal Five, was made the new commander of the Gold Cloaks. A bull of a man, nigh on seven feet tall, Largent was rumoured to have once killed a warhorse with a single punch. Sir Otto Hightower, being a prudent man, he took care to name his own son, Sir Gwain Hightower, the Queen's brother, as Largent's second, instructing him to keep a wary eye on Sir Luther for any sign of disloyalty. Sir Tylan Lannister was named Master of Coin in place of the late Lord Beesbury, and acted at once to seize the royal treasury. The crown's gold was divided into four parts. One part was entrusted to the care of the Iron Bank of Bravos for safekeeping, another sent under strong guard to Casterly Rock, a third to Old Town. The remaining wealth was to be used for bribes and gifts, and to hire sellswords if needed. To take Sir Tylan's place as Master of Ships, Sir Otto looked to the Iron Islands, dispatching a raven for Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, the daring, bloodthirsty, sixty year-old Lord Reaper of Pike, offering him the Admiralty and a seat on the council for his allegiance. The annals of the Great Council of 101 were brought forth and examined. A note was made of which lords had spoken for Viserys and which for Rhaenys, Lena, and Lenor. The lords assembled had favoured the male claimants over the female by 20 to 1, but there were still dissenters, and those same houses were most likely to lend their support to Princess Rhaenyra should it come to war. The princess would have the sea snake and his fleets, Sir Otto judged, and like as not, the other lords of the Great Eastern Shore as well, Lord Bar Emmon, Massey, Caltagar, and Crab, most like, perhaps even the even Star of Tarth, all were lesser powers save for the Valarians. The Northmen were a much greater concern. 
as Winterfell had spoken for Rhaenys at Harrenhal, as had Lord Stark's bannermen, Dustin of Barrowton and the Mandalays of White Harbour. Nor could House Arryn be relied upon, for the Eyrie was presently ruled by a woman, Lady Jane, the Maiden of the Vale, whose own rights may be called into question should Princess Rhaenyra be put aside. The greatest danger was deemed to be Storm's End. The House Baratheon had always been a staunch in support of the claims of Princess Rhaenys and her children. The old Lord Bormund had died. His son Boros was even more belligerent than his father, and the lesser Storm Lords would surely follow wherever he led. Then we must see that he leads them to our king, Alison declared, whereupon she sent for her second son. Thus, it was not a raven that took flight for Storm's End, but Vagar, oldest and largest of the dragons of Westeros. On her back rode Prince Aemon Targaryen, with a sapphire in place of his missing eye. Your purpose is to win the hand of one of Lord Baratheon's daughters, his grandsire Sir Otto told him, before he flew. Any of the four will do, woo her and wed her, and Lord Boris will deliver the Stormlands for your brother. Fail, I will not fail, Aemon blasted. Aegon will have the Stormlands and I will have this girl. By the time Prince Aemon took his leave, the stink from the king's bedchamber had wafted all through Maegor's Holdfast, and many wild tales of rumours were spread through the court and castle. The dungeons of the Red Keep swallowed up so many men suspected of disloyalty that even the High Septon had begun to wonder at these disappearances, and sent word from the starry sept of Old Town asking for some of the missing. So Otto Hightower, as methodical a man as ever served his hand, wanted more time to make preparations, but Queen Alicent knew that they could delay no longer. Prince Aegon had grown weary of secrecy. I am king or not, he demanded of his mother. If I am king, then crown me. The bells began to ring on the tenth day of the third moon of 129 AC tolling the end of a reign. Grandmaster Orwell was the last allowed to send forth his ravens, and the black birds took to the air by hundreds, spreading word of Aegon's ascension to every far corner of the realm. The silent sisters were sent forth to prepare the corpse of burning, and riders were sent forth on pale horses to spread the word to the people of King's Landing, crying, King Viserys is dead. Long live King Aegon. Hearing the cries, Munkern writes, some wept, while others cheered. Most of the small folk stared in silence, confused and weary, and now and again a voice cried out, Long live our queen. Meanwhile, hurry preparations were being made for the coronation. The dragon pit was chosen as the site. Under its mighty dome were stone benches sufficient to seat 80,000, and the pit's thick walls, strong roof, and towering bronze door made it defensible should traitors attempt to disrupt the ceremony. On the appointed day, Sir Christian Cole placed an iron and ruby crown of Aegon the Conqueror upon the brow of the eldest son of King Viserys and Queen Alicent, claiming him Aegon of House Targaryen, second of his name, King of the Andals, the Roynar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, and Protector of the Realm. His mother, Queen Alicent, beloved of the small folk, placed her own crown upon the head of her daughter, Helena, Aegon's wife and sister. The mother bent before the daughter, bowed her head, and said, my queen. How many came to see the crowning remains a matter of dispute. Grandmaster Munking, drawing upon Orwell, tells us that more than a hundred thousand small folk jammed into the dragon pit. Their cheers so loud they shook the walls. Was Mushroom says that the stone benches were half filled, with High Septon in Old Town, too old and frail to journey to King's Landing. They fell to Septon Eustace to anoint King Aegon's brow with holy oils. A few of those in attendance with sharper eyes than most might have noticed there were but four white cloaks in attendance of the new king, not five, as henceforth Aegon II had suffered the first defection the night before when Sir Stephen Darkland of the Kingsguard had slipped from the city with his squire, two stewards and four guardsmen. Under the cover of darkness they made their way out Poston Gate where a fisherman's skiff awaited to take them to Dragonstone. They brought with them a stolen crown, a band of yellow gold ornate with seven gems of different colours. This is the crown King Viserys had worn and the old king Jaehaerys before him. Prince Aegon had decided to wear the iron and ruby crown of his namesake. Queen Alicent had ordered Viserys's crown locked away but the steward entrusted with the task had made off with it instead. After the coronation, the remaining Kingsguard escorted Aegon to his mount, a splendid creature with glimmering gold scales and pale pink wings. Sunfire was the name given to the dragon of the Golden Dawn. Munkin tells us they flew thrice around the city before landing inside the walls of the Red Keep. Sir Eric Cargill led his grace to the torchlit throne room. Aegon II mounted the steps of the Iron Throne before a thousand lords and knights. Shouts rang throughout the hall.